Okay, let's try again. We welcome you to this Lord's Day of Worship. And hopefully the ringing will stop. Thank you. Um, we also welcome a new member of our staff, Tony Brukley. Um, he is our new property manager. He is retired, plays golf, and is the brother of our own Ann Hutchinson. And he has been added to the mobile directory as well as the website, and there will be a write-up about him in the next Illuminator. So if you see Tony around, please welcome him to our church family. We also want to extend condolences to the Stewart family on the death of Chloe Stewart. Chloe passed away on Thursday, August 4th, and his service will be tomorrow at 1 o'clock at the Becker Funeral Home here in Poland. And Reverend Annie Parker from Heritage Presbyterian will be officiating. So please keep the Stewart family in your prayers. Please join us, um, Sheila Waldlinger, um, as I just butchered her last name, um, for lemonade after the service. And Wit will be having a picnic tomorrow and, sorry, on the 15th at 11.30 in the Boardman Park. No grief support group online for this month. Um, and that's all the announcements we have. Let us go to God in prayer. worship the eternal God. Let us worship Jesus Christ. Let us worship the Holy Spirit. Come, let us worship the one true God in all times and places.
God's love has been poured into our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God in confidence. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Good and loving God, sometimes our hearts grow cold. Sometimes our faith becomes dry. Sometimes our prayers are automatic and without any kind of passion. Lord, forgive us. Stir within us that desire to live for the glory of your name and restore us to have that strong devotion for your Son, our Lord, who is the way, truth, and life. Hear the good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Children, please come up. Good morning. How are you? Come on up. Hi, Luca. How's everyone today? You good? Oh, I got a thumbs up. All right. So your day's going pretty well. Well, oh, hi. Come on up. So let me tell you about my morning. I got here, and I did a few things around my office, and then I was trying to open this container of beads. And boy, I couldn't get it. I was twisting and twisting. And because of my strong muscles, I ripped the top off and the beads went flying all over my office, everywhere. I just couldn't believe they were on the floor, they were on my desk, they were everywhere. And right away, I thought, oh, why did this happen to me? There goes my whole day. And I was looking around trying to figure out how am I going to clean up this mess? 
And then you know what I started to do? I started to laugh because it was just, it, it was unbelievable. I should have taken some pictures of it to show you. But as soon as I started to laugh, I felt better. Don't you feel better after you laugh? It, it makes you just let go of everything that you're worried about. So I got everything cleaned up, which was amazing. And then after that, I said a prayer. And I thank God for giving me the joy of laughter. I thank God for letting me know that nothing is so bad that it can't be fixed. And then the last part of my prayer, I asked God to make sure that Dr. Anderson didn't come up to my office before I got it cleaned up. <laughs> so it all worked out. But we all need to remember that. No matter when those little things or big things happen, God's always backing us up and nothing out there, there's nothing that can't be fixed. Can you remember that this week? Is that something good to remember, I think? All right, let's bow our heads. Gracious God, we thank you for bringing our church family together today. We thank you for the gift of laughter, for the joy of knowing that you are always with us, and for the love of your son, in whose name we always pray. And all together we say, Amen. All right, have a wonderful day. summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. 
Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silent. Before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around him. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O oh my people, and I will speak. O oh Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Blessed are you, God, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. this morning is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through waterless regions looking for a resting place. But not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. 
when it returns, it find it swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and live there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. While he was saying this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the woman that bore and nursed you. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day as we hear your word and help us to live your word now and always. Amen. Once upon a time, there was a farmer who was going into town to pick up some supplies. It was such a lovely day, he decided not to drive, but to take his horse and wagon instead. So he loaded it up, he put the dog in the front with him, and off he went into town. On his way back, the horse got spooked when a truck came around the corner too fast. The horse went crazy, the wagon overturned, the dog was thrown from the cart, and the farmer ended up pinned underneath the front axle. Unable to move, to move, he really didn't know what to do next. But luckily a neighbor happened by and stopped to help. First the neighbor went over to the horse, and he noticed that it was hurt pretty badly. Upon closer examination, he saw that the horse had broken both front legs. Now, without saying it, we all know what needs to be done when a horse breaks a leg. So the neighbor got out his pistol and he helped the horse not to suffer any longer. Next, he went to help the dog and he saw that it was also hurt. In fact, the dog was hurt so badly that it was just a matter of time. And not wanting the dog's final moments to be in pain and misery, the neighbor did for the dog the same thing that he had done for the horse. Finally, the man went to help the farmer, and the farmer was kind of in a ditch, so he was standing over him, still with the smoking gun in his hand, and he looked down with him in pity and said, Are you hurt? <laughs> mm, folks, I expected a little more. I worked really hard to, to not say die or kill in that story. There are times in life when we go through those difficult stages, um, entering into moments of crisis and needing help from others. We go through times of goodness and times of sadness, moments of triumph, and instances where nothing seems to go right or we seem to make all the wrong choices. Fortunately, as Christians, we have each other to count on. We have Christ to guide us and lead us every step of the way. Today we encounter that guidance in our scripture passage. A story in which Jesus is giving sage, sound, scholarly advice. Just, just brilliant stuff worthy of our time. The setting is as follows. Jesus was performing a miracle in which he was driving out a demon from a man who was mute. When the demon was gone, the man spoke. The crowd of witnesses were split by their reaction. Some were amazed. Some said that he was working with the prince of demons. Some wanted him to show them a further sign from heaven. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he addressed the crowd. And it is near the end of this speech that we get today's Bible passage. This is one of those readings in which the language and the culture from the time of Jesus is different than the way we live today. This parable discusses empty souls and demons and possessions and seven other demons coming into the mix, things that are foreign to us. So let me try and put it into our frame of reference. There can come a time in a person's life when they decide wholeheartedly to make a change. Their life up until that point was, has been selfish and immoral and sinful. And after much soul searching and hard work, the individual makes a positive change and they rid themselves of their sinful behavior. After some time, they are living right and feeling much better about their life. The evil ways and thoughts and actions are gone. But the tendencies are still there. 
the compulsion to go back to that way of life is ever present. If the person gives in to the temptation, the old way of living comes back with a vengeance and the person's behavior and actions will be ten times worse than before. This is why Jesus reminds us how important it is to fill our lives with goodness. Now gleaning from Barclay's commentary, we discover that being filled with goodness involves three things. First, we must recognize that our sinful ways never really go away. Second, our faith, our religion, our relationship with Christ cannot be sustained by negatives. And third, the best way to stay away from sinful behavior is to do good things. So let's take these one at a time. First, we recognize that our sinful ways never really go away. Now, this is not a big eye-opening revelation. We know this. We know that we are sinful human beings. We know that the impulse is always there to sin. We know that however we try to live, however we try to be pure and honorable and just and pleasing and commendable, sin still enters in. We know that every day is a struggle to do what is right. That is why habits are hard to break. That is why temptations are powerful incentives. That is why telling, something to, telling someone to not do something usually has the opposite effect. The best way to approach this point of Jesus is to see it as a gentle reminder, an opportunity for review, a positive way to remember that we are sinful people. So then how do we keep that sin in check? It would be helpful if there was a self-help book that we could read. There is, it's called the Bible. Is there a meeting or a class we could attend? Yes, it's called church. Is there someone we can talk to? That's called prayer. Is there an example we can look to? That would be Jesus. And even though all of these things that we do to be good or important, it is that presence of Jesus in our lives that is crucial for us to survive our sinful behaviors. God's living presence is the key. Jesus is the vine that we can cling to. He is the light which shines brightly in our dark world. Jesus is the lamp unto our feet and the cornerstone on which our foundation is built. Now, we may not be able to completely eradicate the evil spirit from within, but we can live in a way that shows that we love God's children, we give God's glory, and we offer God's peace. Second thing we learn is that our faith, our relationship with Christ, cannot be sustained on negatives. In Scripture, the man had the evil spirit driven away and his soul was empty which means it was open to negative thoughts, to the sinful lifestyle returning. It is not enough that the evil thoughts were gone, they needed to be replaced with positive ones. Too often in the church and in life we are told to be good boys and girls by staying away from all the negative influences. Do, do not lie, do not steal, don't do drugs, don't sin, don't deny God, stay away from dishonest people, and so on and so forth. But if the negatives were all that we focused on as Christian people, our faith would lack substance. Taking away the negative is only half of the task. Our lives need to be filled with positive things. These actions and things are things that we are already doing. Providing for our families, helping those in need, serving our church, being a good citizen, making the right choices, forgiving and being forgiven. Sometimes it's so easy to concentrate on the sin and the bad and the negative that it's easy not to see that we're already doing good things every day as well. And it's so important to focus on the good, the positive, the changes that we can affect. And this brings us to our final point. The best way to stay away from the sinful behavior is to do or to be filled with God's goodness.
or simply stated, the best way to avoid evil is to do good. In our lesson today, the evil spirit left the man. His soul was clean, everything was swept and empty. That sounds like a good thing. However, the evil spirit was able to find other spirits and they all filled the man's soul and he was worse off than before. Why? Well, it's because when we get rid of the evil influences that are controlling our lives, it creates a gap, a void, if you will. And that void needs to be filled. If we don't fill it with God's love and care, then something else will fill that space. Adam C. Welch, who was the professor of Hebrew and Old Testament exegesis in Edinburgh in 1913, said this, It is not enough to drive out evil. The good must come in. And this is a similar concept. I, I learned this, or I, I, I at least can emphasize this, by something I recently learned about gardening. I'm going to share it. There were sections of my lawn that contained more weeds than grass. So I called one of those services that comes by and they spray and they remove all the weeds and, they get, and the grass grows and you pay them all that money and your grass looks really good. Now, I, I'm not an expert on how to care for my lawn. I know how to cut it and trim it and make it look clean and crisp. I know that the lawn needs to be watered. I know you don't mow when it's snowing. I also know my son Colin is suspiciously, suspiciously absent every time the lawn needs cut. But that's about it as far as my knowledge on the care of my lawn. So when the professional was giving me the sales pitch, I asked him that since a lot of grass has been overtaken by the weeds, will I need to replant grass seed once all the weeds have been removed? And I learned that I did not need new grass because once the weeds were gone, the grass would flourish and it would spread out and it would fill in all those empty spots beautifully. And that's the same with us. Once our sinful behavior is gone, the weeds, our good thoughts and behaviors and actions and deeds and morals and ethics, the grass, will fill in that empty space and before long our lives, or the entire lawn, will be beautiful, lovely, and brimming over with goodness. Max Lucado makes this conscious decision in his book, Grace for the Moment. He says this, I will be influenced by God. I will be taught only by Christ. To these I commit my day. If I succeed, I will give thanks. If I fail, I will seek His grace. And when this day is done, I will place my head on my pillow and rest. That is how we clean our souls. That is how we focus on the positive. That is how we replace the sinful with goodness. So for today, I want to tell you a story about a man. Let's give him a name. Let's call him Jack. And this is the story of Jack. Jack had this thing that he did every night. He he did what he called his evening constitutional. Now that was Jack's big fancy way of telling his wife that he was going for a walk. And every night, Jack went for a walk. 24-7, 365 days a year, rain or shine, ailing or healthy, Jack walked. And he had the same routine. He would, he would come out his front door, he'd go to the bottom of the street, and sometimes he'd go to the right, and take his walk. Sometimes he'd go to the left, and sometimes he would get in his car and he would drive to the local park because it had this great big trail that went around the whole area, the whole circumference of the park. And that was a good long walk that took miles. And on this particular evening, Jack went to the park. And he's walking in the park, very uneventful, same thing that happens all the time. And when he walks in the park, because it takes a little bit longer, Instead of listening to the music in his iPod, when he's at the park, he, he goes through things in his head. The first thing he does is he, he goes through his day, what he did that day, what was good, what was bad, what could he do differently. And then he goes through his schedule for the next day. You know, when he's going to get up, 
the, the goals he has to achieve, the things he has to do, so on and so forth. And then he finishes the walk around the park by having a prayer to God. And so he's doing this as his routine. And he gets, he's, he's almost done. And, and he's walking along and he's doing things in his head. And he hears a, a strange noise. So he stops and he listens very intently. And in these big tall bushes, about 30 feet from him, he hears this strange noise. It, it was heavy beleaguered breathing. It was muffled screams. It was that, that tearing of fabric, that, that feeling of stress and awkwardness that something was terribly wrong. And so he listened intently and, and he knew that there was a young woman being attacked in those bushes just 30 feet away. So now Jack had to decide what to do. Did he do nothing? Did he turn around, mind his own business, and walk away? Did he, did, should he call 911? Should he do nothing? Should he get involved and help? And, and what would happen if he was to get involved and help this woman? He may make things worse. He could end up being the injured party. He could end up in a lot worse shape than that. Yes. And, and what happens if he goes to help and in all the confusion okay. when everything's over, what happens if a young lady in her terror and frightened state names him as the attacker? What, what happens if this is all a ruse for, to be able to mug and rob some good Samaritan that would jump in and help? All of these things going around his head, it sounds like it takes him an hour to decide. And of course, with the brain and the adrenaline working, it was just a few seconds. Jack decides that this is another human being. He needs to do something. He needs to help. He didn't really know what to do because he, he wasn't an athletic man. He wasn't a strong man. He didn't have some ninth degree black belt in this or that. He was, he was just a man that was scared to death that knew he needed to do something. So he gets that adrenaline going, he runs behind those bushes, he takes that assailant, he throws him off the woman, they fall on the ground and they wrestle and fight rolling about the bushes. And after about 10 or 15 seconds, the, the attacker pushes him away, jumps up and runs away. And then Jack also gets to his feet as well. And he's still breathing hard, and he's still scared to death, but his thoughts go immediately to that young lady. Because he doesn't know if she's okay. He doesn't know if she knows that, that she's safe now. It's dark, he can't really see her. All he knows is she's crouching behind a tree, crying and sobbing away. So he tries as comforting and as soothingly as possible to say to her, Miss, it's okay, you can come out now. I was able to scare off the man that was hurting me. And there was a long pause before the lady said anything. <coughs> now, selfishly, humanly, Jack was expecting to hear a thank you. Was expecting this lady to give some comfort, was expecting this lady to come out so that he could help her if he needed to, and that's not what, he didn't get that thank you. After the long silence, he heard the words, Dad, is that you? And out from the tree came Jack's daughter. I can see it in your faces, so I'm just going to wait a second. John Wesley once said, Do all the good you can, whenever you can, for as many souls as you can, in all the places you can, at all the time you can, with all the zeal you can, for as long as you can. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us this day as we do your work, now and always. Amen. As we move into our time of the Lord's Supper, let us recite together the great thanksgiving prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us and prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it, gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we come here as a community, a family. We give you, O God, our thanks and praise. We thank you for our blessings, for the earth that we call home, for our gifts and abilities in which we can serve our loving Creator. And we give thanks for the gift of Christ our Lord. Christ guides us, leads us, heals us, saves us, forgives us, prays for us, and loves us. And as we live each day for you, O God, help us to do away with our sinfulness. Guide us in your living so that we can silence the evil word, prevent the sinful action, break the bad habit, and banish the wicked thought. Shine your light into our hearts, O God, Give us the courage to be your beacon of hope to our families, communities, and the larger world. May your blessings give us the strength to seek and find, to know and love, to obey and live. Give us the resolve to do that which is right. May we work and pray each day for justice, fairness, equality, and freedom, and the opportunity to be your hands and feet and voice for everyone. As we pray this day, open our hearts as we lift up to you Kathy and Ken, Jared, Kitty, Lucy, Thad, Lee, and the Stuart family. It is with thanksgiving that we partake in this Lord's Last Supper. May we take this bread and cup and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. We ask that you pour out your spirit upon us so that this meal may be a communion that we share, making us one with Christ and all who share in this feast. And bind us together in that immortal prayer of Christ. Hear us as we pray now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it and broke it, and said, This is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, and said, this cup represents a new covenant, sealed in my blood. For as often as you eat the bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. As the officers come forward to serve communion, just as a reminder, we, we do this in two ways. If everyone on this side would form up here, you'll come up to the front, you'll take the bread, you'll take the, the juice, You'll partake right here, and then there's a basket you can discard the trash in, and then go back to the grass by the center. So everyone on this side can come to this line, and everyone on this side can come to this line. And if you would rather me serve you, just let me know, and I'll come to you. And now let's just come and have. 